Hello and welcome back to the Timur Podcast, a show that investigates the 14th century conqueror known to history as Timur or Temur, Tamerlane or simply Timur. And before we dive right into this thing, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Which do you want to hear first? Okay, the bad news. The bad news is that I ran out of time this week to finish our next regular episode. My wife got a bit sick this week. She's been staying home. Uh, I don't think it's anything too serious, thankfully, but between work and taking care of her and taking care of our psychopath dog, I wasn't able to finish the episode. It's a bit longer than normal, and it's a pretty important episode. So instead of rushing to to release it, I decided to push it back a week. I know... I'm pretty bummed about this as well. So if you're angry, like I am, just just blame her. But as for the good news, you'll notice that this episode is a lot shorter than usual, and that is because this is the first episode of a new mini-series for the show. Now don't worry, this new series will be released in addition to our normal weekly episodes on Timur. Uh, except for this week, of course, so there's another lie. Just throw that on the, on the pile of lies. But... I've decided that the best way to talk about our primary sources on Timur is by having these mini-sources along the way. There won't be any predictable schedule to these things, they'll just sort of pop up whenever I have time to make them. And before you shut this off, I know talking about sources can be really, really boring. But I will do my best to make these short episodes at least somewhat interesting. But the helpful thing about the sources on Timur's life is that they are written by people who have really interesting stories of their own. And these stories oftentimes overlap with Timur's story, as you might expect. Now, one more quick thing before we get into our first source. I will release a mini-episode for every primary source that I use but not the secondary sources. And if you're unsure what the difference is between primary and secondary sources, basically primary sources are generally first-hand accounts of a historical event, eyewitness records, interviews, maybe the author's own experiences, things like that. Secondary sources are later interpretations or evaluations of the primary sources. So I'm drawing on many books about Timur written by historians in the past 200 years or so, Those are all secondary sources, as none of those authors were alive during Timur's life. And they, like us, have to rely on the primary sources. And there are simply too many secondary sources that I'm using for me to go through each one with a mini-episode. But I will release an annotated bibliography of these at some point, maybe, hopefully. Anyway, with all that cleared up, let's begin this new section of the show, Our Sources. I decided that we would start with the Zafarnama written by a man named Sharaf Adin Ali Yazdi. I chose this source to begin with because it is possibly our best primary source, it is also my personal favorite, and it is the source I've been mentioning the most so far. So let's begin by talking about the author, a man named Sharaf Adin Ali Yazdi, who was born in the 1370s, probably in the city of Yazd, which is in modern-day Iran, about right in the middle of the country. The name Yazdi is a popular name of people from Yazd, and that's how we know he was probably from here. Uh, Very little is known about Yazdi's early life, but at some point he received an excellent education and was probably a member of Timur's court, or at least financed by the Timurid government. In his 30s, Yazdi's, Yazdi studied in Syria and then in Egypt, further mastering his understanding of art, sciences, and history. He was also a brilliant mathematician, and it was his mastery of math that helped him gain prominence in the Timurid court. Now, I don't want to give too much away, but in case you don't know, Timur eventually does die. He died in the year 1405, and with his death, his realm was thrown into civil war and anarchy for a short period until his son, Shahrukh, won and took Timur's throne. Now, Shahrukh is a fascinating figure, and we will definitely talk about him when we get to him in the story, but that is a far way off. Uh, But important for us now is that Shahrukh was a great patron of the arts and of the sciences. And as such, Shahrukh and Yazdi quickly became close companions and possibly even friends. Yazdi was also a friend to Shah Rukh's son and later Timurid ruler Ibrahim Sultan, or Ibrahim Sultan. Uh, from 1405 until Shah Rukh's death in 1447, Yazdi was often at the Timurid court teaching with other, other experts or writing various books under his pen name Sharaf. 
Then in 1442 or 1443, Yazdi was sent to help advise the Timurid governor of Iraq, a man named Mirza Sultan Muhammad. Uh, and this turned out a bit badly when Muhammad attempted to rebel against Sharuk, but was quickly defeated and removed. Thankfully for Yazdi, though, and for us, he was acquitted of treason because of his previous support and contributions to Timurid academia. Yazdi then spent the rest of his years in the city of Taft in his home province, and he died in the year 1454. So that is a very brief overview of Yazdi's story, and congratulations, Yazdi has arguably the least exciting story of every author of every other author of the other primary sources. But we're not done yet because we haven't even talked about the primary source. What Yazdi is most remembered for is his book, the y the Zafarnamo. <laughs> I messed that up, which translates to the Book of Victories. And it is an account of Timur's life and conquests. While Yazdi was alive during Timur's reign and probably knew him, the Zafarnama was not written until 20 years or so after Timur's death. Yazdi wrote the book from about 1421 until 1425, and it was commissioned by Timur's grandson, Ibrahim Sultan. Uh, Yazdi's account is based on Yazdi's own knowledge of Timur, a collection of notes and other accounts he drew from, and also largely based on an earlier record of the same name. This earlier version of the Zafarnama was written by a man named Nizam ad-Din Shami, and was written during Timur's reign and finished a year before Timur's death. As such, this earlier Zafarnama does not include Timur's death or the ensuing aftermath, thus Yazdi's version is the more famous and the more completed one that is referenced more. Now, what's interesting about uh, Yazdi's Zafarnama is that if you recall any of the passages I've read, you'll know this, but Yazdi uses very descriptive and even explosive language to narrate the story and really make it come to life. And th this is my favorite thing about the Zafarnama. It is so exciting and full of passion and emotion. But funny enough, Timur would have hated this. Timur was a no-nonsense guy. He very rarely laughed or smiled, he hated practical jokes and jests, and he preferred everything to be recorded and reported in precise, simple language. Now, don't get the wrong idea. Timur wasn't dumb. He was actually brilliant. One source tells us that Timur would have historians read various histories of the Mongols and the Middle East to him, and he would often interrupt to correct them on points they got wrong. Uh, but the man had things to do and cities to conquer everything needed to be efficient. And true to this pattern, Timur wanted to be remembered in very simple language. Language that would get to the point quickly and would ex be accessible to the people. But then you read the Zafarnama, and it is full of colorful details and riveting drama, and it's the exact opposite of what Timur wanted. And this is because the Timurid dynasty and Timurid culture drastically changed after his death. Uh, as we'll see with Timur, as he lays waste to countless cities and slaughters or enslaves the populations, he very often spares the intellectual citizens. Philosophers, teachers, mathematicians, scholars, theologians, artisans, masons, architects, and so on, Timur wants them alive. And he wanted them so that he could ship them back to his capital of Samarkand and make the city the most glorious city in all the world. And this became pretty standard for his conquests. In fact, Nizam ad-Din Shami, who we just mentioned, he's the guy who wrote the first version of the Zafarnama, he was one of these intellectuals who was spared. When Timur besieges Baghdad, Shami leaves the city and submits to Timur, was spared, and then was elevated. Because that's the other weird thing to the story of Timur. Timur didn't want to enslave these intellectuals and artisans, he wanted them to perform their best work possible. And anything they needed to do so, Timur would give it to them. And as such, during Timur's rule, but especially in the decades following, the Timurid Empire brought on a new Islamic golden age in Central Asia. And it, this is not surprising. You gather the smartest, most educated, most skilled people in one city, and then shower them with the funds and ability to do their things, while well, amazing things are going to follow. And as such, the Timurid Renaissance, as it's called, bursts into life out from the ash and corpse-filled wasteland that Timur created. So circling back, the Timurid Renaissance is going to sweep across all aspects of Timurid culture, including history, poetry, and writing. And as such, by the time Yazdi is writing the Zafarnama, even though it's only 20 years after Timur's death, the Timurid courts and culture want exciting and colorful descriptions of Timur rather than the bland, efficient retelling that Timur had wanted. And that's why Yazdi's account is so full of life as much as it is. As for the accuracy of the Zafarnama, 
it's pretty decent. It is one of the best sources we have on Timur as it was written only 20 years after his death. It's based on accounts from people who, who lived the story and the author probably maybe even met Timur. But unsurprisingly, the Zafarnama is very, very pro-Timur, as can be expected. Uh, thus, certain atrocities carried out by the conqueror are left out, Timur is sometimes given too much credit, or his adversaries too little, and so on and so forth. Still though, it is one of the best accounts that we have. Yazdi's Zafarnama was eventually translated into French in the year 1722, and then into English the following year in 1723, and it is this version that I have been using. Anyways, before we wrap things up though, one of the greatest things about the Zafarnama is that it is heavily illustrated with beautiful Timurid drawings. There are several versions of the Zafarnama, most of them don't have these pictures, but three copies of 15th century editions of the Zafarnama do still survive and all have different but wonderful drawings in them. One of these editions is currently in Istanbul at the Turkish and Islamic Arts Museum. The second copy is called the Zafarnama of Ibrahim Sultan, and I, for the life of me, could not find its current location, but it is out there somewhere. Uh, the third version, called the Garrett Zafarnama, is located at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, of all places. And these three versions have several wonderful drawings. I will, I will post some of them on Facebook and Twitter, and eventually when I get to it on our website, but they are definitely worth checking out. They are beautiful. But that is about it for Sharif Adin Ali Yazdi's Zafarnama, or Book of Victories. I hope you found this enjoyable. I will keep making these short episodes on the sources every once in a while, but there are some absolutely insane stories behind some of these sources, so make sure you listen to them if you want to. I'm not forcing you. Uh, but speaking of, I'm hoping to get our second source episode out tonight. I have most of it written, so I might, well, I definitely won't finish writing it at work that is... That's absurd and unethical. I won't do that. But hopefully, if I have time tonight, I'll, I'll finish this episode and get it out. Um, it, it's a pretty good one, I think. Anyways, that is it for this week and our, our first episode on the sources. Next week, we should be back into the full swing of things. Again, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but sometimes bad things happen to... I won't say good people, but to people like me. As always, feel free to reach out to me for any time and for any reason. You can email me at timmerpodcast at gmail.com or follow the show on Facebook at TimmerPod or on Twitter at Podcast Timmer. Or check out the show's ugly website at timmerpodcast.com. If you are enjoying the story of Timmer, a rating or review on whatever listening platform you're using helps a lot and it makes me happy. Anyway, later this week, we will jump back into the narrative and see what happens when Timur and Hussein attempt to push the Mughals out of Transoxiana. Join me next time right here on the Timur Podcast. Mm -hmm.